I'm a professor of computer science uh, here at the University of York. Uh, I'm director of the, the NEMO project. Um, and three years ago now, a little under three years ago, um, I gave a talk. I was probably a little more nervous then. I'm pretty nervous now, so uh, probably a little more nervous then because I don't think I talked to quite so many audiences this large, um, especially of my peers. Um, and I said, I think we're starting something. And there was this big kind of hum in the room. You know, everybody thought, well, do you think there's something happening here? What, what's going on? And do you want to know something? We were right. Yeah, we started something. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go through the slides in a minute. But I think the most outstanding things to come from the project, we're going to talk about all of those today. Um, and especially about the fact that we got the attention of the games community, yourselves, um, at the same time as we got the attention of the UK government research funders. Um, and in the, the three years uh, in the interim, uh, we've been extraordinarily successful in persuading the UK government to dip deep into their pockets to do research which is a benefit uh, to the games industry and which is looking at using games in new ways. So, so I, I think we, we've done something that's important. We've started that journey. Um, anyway, let me not foreshadow my slides uh, too much. Um, so the whole team's going to talk about some of the highlights of what we've achieved in the past three years. Um, and uh, let me start by reminding you that NEMOG starts for new economic models and opportunities in digital games. So the way that today will work is that I will stay religiously to the script, sorry to the rest of the NEMOG team from now on. Um, we will uh, unusually, we'll have a long presentation with many small talks. Yeah, we won't divide, we won't salami slice it. So we'll have many of the researchers talking about the highlights uh, in something that we've called the story so far. Then we'll have a very extended uh, coffee break and a chance to talk to the researchers uh, and look at posters and demos. So the, the point of this sort of event is if it's just me or others as talking heads talking to you, I don't know, then within about 20 minutes, you're looking at your email or you know, Facebook or whatever, um, and, and, and it doesn't serve the purpose. So, so our aim is to give you a sort of a minimally stimulating amount of content so that you can actually go out and talk to the people who've done the research um, and that's, that's certainly our, our plan. Then I'm delighted that we have a keynote, I caught you say a second ago, from uh, Anders Draken. Um, and Anders Draken is, is really one of, internationally, one of the, the, the world's leaders uh, in game analytics. And I'm really pleased that we've, we've persuaded uh, Anders to be here. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to his, his talk. Um, then we will have a, a panel discussion, a, a, an interaction, a, a sort of plenary interaction, and a panel uh, on uh, new directions for games. Um, and that'll be the chance to you ask question, for you to ask questions and to have a, an interactive uh, but plenary session. And then we'll have some uh, more networking, more posters, more demos. Um, some of the demos are really very cool. Um, I'm very jealous of some of the demos that somebody has already been talking about today um, that I've not seen yet. And we'll have some finger food and some drinks. Um, so, uh, so you'll see I've highlighted the three very critical parts of the day, coffee, finger food, and drinks. Um, and uh, I, I hope you do find it an interactive experience. Yeah, we want to find ways uh, to, to talk with you. Yeah, we don't just want you to, I don't know, to, to kind of, you know, to spout about what we've done and have you think, yeah, that's very clever. Okay, you know, next one's only a year off. Yeah, we, we actually want to find a way to, to link with you and to, to, to continue to uh, have a discussion. So I'm going to whiz through the slides that I presented three years ago, really whiz through the slides um, in a tremendous uh, opening talk. And I, I, I'm delighted that we have the, one of the speakers from that talk, Charles Cecil, is here. Uh, Jeffrey Lynn uh, from Riot Games, he, he gave another um, uh, plenary. And I, let me whiz through those slides just to frame the things that we thought we were going to do in Nimog three years ago in about five minutes, which I have left. And then people uh, from the NEMOG research team will talk about what we actually did. Yeah, what did we do uh, with your cooperation, your help, and the government's money? Um, so, okay, games are fun. Um, and we want to harness that fun. Uh, I'm pleased one of the, the, uh, the thing here at the top 
is a thousand-year-old game that was found uh, around Coppergate in York. Um, so games have been around since the dawn of intelligence, yeah? And games obviously are played not just by humans, but by uh, almost all mammal uh, species and probably some other species as well. Um, but the thing that we're interested in is the fact that they're important. So in terms of the cash in the games industry, um, as we approach uh, 11 uh, zeros, yeah, $100 billion as an industry, um, then the games industry is much bigger than the film industry, much bigger than DVD, and much bigger than music. Yeah? And, and obviously, we, we pull away from them, and TV's next. Yeah? TV's not so far away now. Um, so maybe in a few years' time, we'll be talking about how we went past the TV industry. Yeah? So games as a social phenomenon, as a way of experiencing digital creativity um, and art interactively, is becoming ever more important. Um, and the thing that I presented rather playfully is that the GDP of the games industry is bigger than the GDP of Croatia, uh, which I think is quite a sweet statistic. But they're important. And one way to understand that is that typically an American teenager by the age of 21 has played 10,000 hours of, of, of digital games. Um, and 10,000 hours is the amount of time playing, say, the piano or the trumpet or, or whatever, that you need to reach um, the, the status of being a virtuoso. So the argument is too simplistic, but forgive me a simplistic argument in front of a big audience with uh, my, my team looking at their watches. Um, but so we're kind of living in an era of virtuoso game players. Yeah, and, and I just think this, this, that's very exciting. Yet yeah, the, the games have captured the imaginations of, of particularly young people, but, but a, a broader demographic now, in ways that I don't think anything else has ever captured imaginations. So uh, we, what do we want to do with games? We want to uh, increase the profitability of the already very profitable UK games industry. Um, we want to have more fun. Uh, we want to have games which allow us to do citizen science, which harness the uh, enthusiasm that people have for games um, to, do, uh, to do science. Um, we want to use games to educate, and we have projects in the DC labs that I'll talk about uh, later on, uh, in, in games for language education in particular. Uh, we want games to be a tool to engage people. Um, so how differently might electoral processes work? I don't want to single out one particular decision that was made recently, but how different might re the results have been if people understood the implications of what they were voting for? Yes, yeah, so, and I think that of all the media you can think of, well, maybe telly did work because, because of the result, but, but in terms of informing people, I think games have a unique position and maybe even a responsibility uh, in that, um, and in areas like well-being and healthcare. So, okay, here's the team. I'm not going to introduce them all. They're, most of them will be uh, talking to you now. Um, Sarah, who's the person, and, and Jane, who, who's the, who are the people that make this all run so smoothly, uh, won't be speaking to you. But I think almost everybody else uh, will be speaking to you. We're three teams, uh, one in uh, game analytics and game data, one in business models, and one in understanding what's going on in the UK games industry and what could be going on in the future. And we've been talking to industry since the start. Uh, here are the, the partners that we had at the bid stage. Um, and also, uh, you can see that the chairs are of, of our advisory boards who have all been external. And I'm delighted that, that Heather Niven from Science City York is here to join us today. Um, so, and we have many more partners at this stage. And if you're here, we want to start that conversation. If you're not a partner, if you've, if you've not joined us on this journey, then I think we might have something to talk about. Uh, not least because we have uh, around the UK, and especially in York, we have about 50 people in this sort of area now. So we have a lot of people to engage with you. Okay. I'm Kieran Fernandez, uh, and I'm a professor of operations management at Durham University Business School. Um, what you probably saw from the last picture is uh, we've been very busy. We've been busy working on some very exciting work packages, like the analytics, uh, the adaptation of business models, 
how can we predict certain things? Where can we use games, society, science, education? And we'll be also very busy with, with having workshops, conferences, talking to, to colleagues. Uh, 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 earlier, Peter mentioned about a number of symposiums we had. Uh, we also have a number of follow-up funding, which uh, Peter in the end will talk about. Uh, some of you are probably playing with the toolkit outside, which we have developed a number of journal papers for the academics who are interested. Uh, their data sets, we had a TEDx event, there were prototypes, uh, policy briefs, etc. So we've been quite busy. And what we're going to do now, over the next uh, hour or so, is briefly talk to you about what our key findings were, what we found interesting, and perhaps you can have some comments about it. Uh, equally, you might want to have a comment chat about it. On which note, I'm going to pass uh, this for the first talk to Professor Feng Li from the CAS Business School. Uh, I'm Feng Li, I'm a professor of information management at CAS Business School, that's in London. Uh, one of the key concepts that has been running throughout this project is the notion of business models. Um, so we have been asking the question, what a business model is, actually why it actually matters to organizations. Uh, so you know, definitions of business models vary, but uh, generally speaking, it refers to the way an organization creates and captures value. I mean, it's a very important concept because it really reflects the dominant logic of an organization. And with this in mind, we actually systematically mapped out the, the key elements and the relationships in a business model. We call that a holistic business model framework. This would be reflecting a lot of the specific activities we have done um, in this project. Um, this framework serves two purposes. On the one hand, it can help organizations understand your own business model by asking a whole range of uh, uh, self-diagnostic questions. You know, what, what sort of values are you creating? Who are you offering those values to? And how do you make money in doing that? And also equally importantly, it's, uh, you know, have you got the capacity internally and also externally to deliver those values to the customers you are targeting? Um, on the other hand, this tool can also be used for organizations to really, by understanding your business models, perhaps explore ways of improving your business models, make plans on changing your business models. You know, the business model is important because, you know, for a, a number of reasons, as some of my, you know, my colleagues are going to talk about the specific research we have done. But the, basically, a business model helps an organization to translate your, your high-level ideas, your visions and strategies into structures and processes and activities. And it's critically important to organizational success, particularly in terms of whether your organization is feasible, how much money are you going to make, and how big you can grow. Uh, now I'm going to hand it over to Ignacio to talk about uh, regional analysis. Hi everybody, I'm Ignacio Cabras. I'm a professor in entrepreneurship and regional economy developer at Newcastle Business School at Northumbria University. And basically one of my interests as well as my demographers is trying to understand the impact of the industry in the UK from a regional perspective. And in order to do so, we wanted to understand how business could survive in this very competitive market. Uh, we had to start from the very beginning, starting from uh, the very origin of the industry, first arcade game, passing through the crash in the 1980s, and then arriving to the most recent development involving mobile games, cloud gaming, AR and VR games, which probably everybody knows from the paraphernalia on the past weeks, Pokemon Go. So basically, the industry is extremely important. In terms of impact worldwide, we have a market size between 40 and 49 billion pounds. As you can see from the graph on the left-hand side, um, the US, in terms of individual contribution, is definitely top of the other country, but the UK comes second. So the importance of the industry for our countries is huge. You can see from the market size in the UK, which is approached probably 3.6 3, 3. billion pounds, uh, Still, uh, the hardware component is taking the lead, but uh, the digital market is uh, increasing from 2009 to 2014. The market has some declining rates, uh, but in the most recent years, it's picking up again. Although we see high level of concentration, the C7 companies, the usual sector, Ubisoft, Microsoft, they account for an extremely huge part of the market size in this country. You can see that in terms of the company turnovers, uh, 4 billion pounds roughly generated in between 2009 and 2013. 
distribution, one out of three companies in London, one out of two, so half of the companies in the UK, between London and the southeast of England. All the rest scattered all over the country. You can see the number of companies, the Yorkshire and Amberside region account for five, six percent of the total. So having this kind of overview, our question was basically, in such a fast changing, rapidly developing environment, what are the chances of company to survive and to strive to assess? So survivability rates. But well, answering this question was quite difficult for a number of reasons. Well, we had uh, a lot of sources in terms of data, but most of the sources they are not standardized. So we have different informations coming from different sources. We decided to focus on the FAME data set, Forecasting, Analysis, and Modeling Econometrics, which is a huge data set that comprises data about companies uh, uh, operating in this country from different sectors. And we managed to extract uh, a database, a sample of companies between 1,300, roughly, operating between 2009 and 2014, understanding whether they are active or inactive. Now, this information comes from that other sort of information, for example, uh, whether the companies were allocated, uh, the number of companies operating in a concentrated market, and we use this information to develop models that actually predict the possibility of a company of being inactive or active in the time span considered. So as you can see, we have different type of variables, the number of directors operating in the companies, whether the companies were located in a tough regional concentrated market, whether there were availability of uh, postgraduate and undergraduate courses in proximity or locations, whether they were developer, publishers, and uh, to cut a long story short and get rid of the numbers, what we find out is that uh, companies operating in the market have a very detrimental impact for the nature of the market itself, a very globalized market, so competition comes from far beyond the national borders, as well as operating in a very dense, very concentrated market is a matter for them that uh, really strive their survivability conditions. Honestly, the opportunity to have access to talents in terms of specialized graduates in the nearby doesn't really make a difference. What it actually makes a difference, though, is the possibility to be located in a network, so in proximity to other companies operating in the same market. London is a very good example, as well as the opportunity to invest in managerial resources. So the better organization, the better director, the better leadership a company has in this particular market for the digital game companies, the better it will be able to survive. Oh, um, my name is Dr. Jian Hua Sao, a specialist in um, data analytics and uh, also management science. Um, doc Dr. Ignacio introduced the uh, work in the video game industry, and I will introduce another work we did specifically in the UK mobile game industry. So when we talk about mobile game, we talk about Angry Bird, Candy Crush, and recently um, Pokemon Go. Uh, those games, they are uh, quite interesting to us because uh, they are either uh, cost nothing for you to play, uh, and designed in a very simple uh, interface, and also, the, um, and, and also the team behind it, they could be small or, or young. Uh, so how those companies, uh, they, they compete and cooperate uh, is interesting to us. Um, and we're specifically uh, interested in the UK um, market uh, and the want to study uh, those companies, they are registered in the UK. Uh, so we have a list of questions to ask uh, them. So for example, uh, whether they are registered as a company or, or, or release game as an individual, where are they from, uh, what, what kind of game they are producing in UK, and what technology are they using, uh, who are the co-founders behind? Uh, where are the investor com investment com comes from? And what's the capital looks like? How they contribute to the regional and the national uh, economies? And more specifically, we look at the visa restriction. Uh, what's going to happen after break ex whether they will get impact or, or not? Uh, so in order to answer those questions, we need a, a big data set and a comprehensive data set. So what we, do, what we did is we did a very large uh, web scripting from the iOS and the Google Play Store. And we linking, uh, we, we, we based on their uh, register location to determine whether they are in UK or not. And we work with a uh, UK uh, company house to determine whether they are company or individuals. So in the end, we find uh, more than 1,000 registered um, mobile game company in UK. Um, 
So this is the results and the, the, the data set, uh, database we, 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 we built. And uh, so basically, uh, we, we, we know uh, what product they sell, what technology they use, uh, what's the, their leadership, employment changes, and uh, how they move their office kind of, kind of stuff. So we, we hope uh, this is not only benefit to our academic research, such as paper writing or stuff. Um, we also want to use this data set to help individuals to find a job, uh, company to compete in the domestic or the global market, and the policy or society to get the overview picture about the UK mobile game uh, industries. Uh, we still have a lot of feature uh, want to add into the systems. So if you are interested, talk to us uh, in the demo session. Now I move to the next speaker, uh, Nick. Hello everyone, my name is Nicolas Umayas, and I'm a research fellow in operations management and research at Durham Business School. Uh, John has the opportunity to talk to you about the diversity within the video game industry, and actually that was one of the greatest challenges we face. What is the video game industry? What it looks like? What type of companies exist there? How can we capture this diversity? Not only now, but also through time, in order to identify what kind of policies and how these policies are going to affect. So what I'm going to talk to you about is how we manage to classify the business models, not only now, but also through time. The common practice that currently is used is a standard industrial classification system. I hope you and I know that many of you are actually familiar with that system. It was introduced in 1948 by the United States of America, and then it was adopted by the United Nations. It classified businesses based uh, on uh, four codes. Uh, one would be the division showing the industry, the business group, and the specialization. But it's very important, standard industrial classification system, because first of all, is the main source of data segmentation and aggregation that is used for national statistics, and it's, fair, it's a source of information for business analysts and, of course, academic research. However, there are certain limitations when it comes to the SIC system. One of it is that it was developed based to express the economic activities of traditional industries, such as manufacturing or agriculture. The question is, can they actually capture the diversity of such a complex and technological intensive industry such as the, uh, the video game industry? And also, how as technologies progress through time, new business models have been creating, and as a result, new industries emerge through that. Can the SIC system actually capture this? United Kingdom trying to overcome this limitation by introducing to a fifth code to the already existent one, capturing the video game development and the video game publishing. This is not common to the other uh, countries around the globe, but only for the United Kingdom. And now the question that raises at this point is that, did they manage to do a good job? Short answer, no. <laughs> These two codes only capture the 35% of the population of the video game industry within the United Kingdom which when we talk about economic impact, social impact, scientific impact, we talk about only 35% of the population. What about the rest? Other, no classify, no classification, other video, other uh, codes. I, in my experience, I managed to identify a video game company classified as cheese producer, I think, which actually is a great problem because if we go to the government and say, change this policy, A policy or B policy, we, actually lack 65% of the economic impact. How did we try to overcome the problem in Imo? First of all, we used three main dimensions of the business model. First of all, customer engagement or value proposition, which is actually the product or the service or a combination of those two. How this product, service, value proposition is being created based on the value chain linkages and the cost structure and also how it is being delivered. As a result, we don't take into consideration only the organizational structure of the business models of the video game industry, but also how they cooperate with each other, what kind of partnerships they create in order to capture as much of the diversity as possible. So to show you the result of our research, I will go back in time. Any, phys any physicist here, you will excuse me, the linear representation of time, but it will be enough for our presentation. Now, going back in time, the video game industry was founded in 1969, and I emphasize the video game industry was founded in that, not the video games. But, uh, 
with arcade games manufacturing, which was highly consolidated and integrated. In 1972, it was possible with the, product, with the production of the first console to vertically disintegrate the value chain, and as a result, the first console manufacturing business model emerged. Following that vertical disintegration, it was possible actually to companies to focus only on video game development, giving rise to the video game development family of business models, and of course, the publishing family of business models. Now, with uh, the evolution of the technology, new business models are actually being possible to be created. Console in 1994, Sony challenged the status quo of the industry by offering the console on par or below par of the price. This created the first time the multi-sided version of the current version of the video games industry, which allowed also the evolution of a new technology, the cloud computing, which actually gave birth to a new uh, business model archetype, the ad network or the open platform network with OnLive and Gaikai open platforms. I'm sure we're going to see many interesting things from these two business models. And of course, as new technologies emerge all the time, it's, it was possible actually to video game developers to bypass the traditional routes of attracting funding from publishers or other traditional sources and move to the crowdfunding era in order to be able to develop video games. Going through time, it, was, it made also allowed us, it made possible not only to identify the diversity of the video game industry, but also to explore how they evolved through time, how they reacted to the changes of the environment, and as a result, understand better the process of acquiring resilience. And I will uh, ask Professor Fernandez to come and talk to us about sector resilience. Um, clearly what uh, Nick has been presenting suggests that in the sector uh, there's not just one type of company or one type of business model, but several. In fact, it's that diversity that exists as a business model that allows firms to be competitive, and this diversity is what allows us to see some very interesting ways of how companies work. All the organizations that are in the sector are undergoing some form of force, either stress, which is a type of force which restricts growth in a company, or a type of force called disturbance, which can potentially destroy companies. So something that is large enough in this sector, for example, a new legislation or something of that sort, could potentially disturb or could create a problem in an organization if they don't overcome it. So all companies are subject to some form of stress or some form of disturbance at any given point in time. What studies also show is that companies have developed different types of business models to survive. And what studies show is that the red zone is the zone where the stress and disturbance is so high that business models cannot survive and live. It's the green zone where the stress and disturbance is manageable for companies to survive and to grow. So what happens in this industry is uh, companies survive in either a zone where the stress and disturbance is quite low, a competitor zone, a zone where the stress is high and disturbance might be low, a stress tolerator zone, or in situations where the disturbance is high and stress is low, which is a rural zone, or for the matter of fact, they could be pretty much anywhere inside this particular survival triangle. And what companies have done is, is, is found different mechanisms. And the primary mechanisms that companies use to survive is managerial decision making. So what companies do as a result of stress, they all start to become very, very proceduralized. So they say, OK, this has worked for us, so let's develop a new process. This has worked for us, a new process, another new process, another new process. Another. By the time you end up with all these processes, your KPIs, KPIs are right, you know what you're doing every time, you're very efficient and all the good things, but as a result of it, you become very, very lean as an organization. There's an issue on the other end, is if you have no procedures, no policies, you end up becoming a slack organization. And in this spectrum, what you end up with is, while there are benefits clearly 
by being a lean organization in terms of efficiency, productivity, clearly you're removing things out in terms of creativity. On the other hand, organizations that are very slack have a lot of creativity in it, but clearly there's an issue of productivity and efficiency. As a result of disturbance, what companies tend to do is they all start to copy and imitate one another, and they say, oh, that's working there. I want to do the same. Oh, that's working in that. I want to do the same. And they all start to look very, very similar or very homogeneous. The other end of the spectrum is they say, well, listen, we're going to try something very different. We're going to be very creative. We're going to try something which has worked in some other sector completely. So they could end up becoming very heterogeneous. As a result of stress and disturbance, what happens overall, which is the key moral of the story, is evolution of companies take place. So companies are constantly, therefore, evolving as a result of these two triggers, stress and disturbance. And the tree-like structure, which Nick showed you earlier, is a result of this evolution over a period of time. I'll just give you one example of what I mean by how characters evolve in organization. So think about uh, an organization which is an independent uh, developer. Uh, let's assume this company has some major disturbance, i.e. they've got a big project, they need to deliver something at a, fi a fixed time, and they have an issue, and that is they have no skilled programmers. Company might decide to do a number of things to overcome this problem. Uh, they might go and talk to university. They might go and probably talk to another company that has the expertise. Or maybe a company might decide to, to uh, overcome this by uh, employing some immigrant workforce with the right skill. What the company is doing as an explicit managerial decision is it's trying to acquire a character which it did not have before the event took place. That's how companies acquire characters through this active managerial decision-making process. And now the ability to employ immigrant workforce and absorb them into your company becomes a characteristic of your company. That's how companies acquire characters. And if you just call this as a character, as a result of this decision, the company acquires a character, something else, something else, something else, and over a period of time, that becomes your company's DNA. That is what makes your company unique because you have responded to very, very specific stress and disturbance related forces that allow you to compete in a very specific context. So what roughly this diagram shows you is exactly what I just said, but done for the large number of companies and all those numbers that you can see on it represent a character or characters that companies have absorbed as a result of either overcoming stress or disturbance. Now, there, there are a number of characters, about 46 or 50 in, in, in the whole sector, and they roughly are doing something very specific. Either they are adding value as a value proposition in one of the life cycles of funding, research, developing, manufacturing, marketing, sales, the sort of usual value chain. They're doing something perhaps in the value creation side or on the value capture side. So these characters manifest themselves, and they're all color-coded over here, in some form to do a very specific task. So if I then start looking at where these characters let companies survive, you can see a number of business models that have been sort of created by the industry to survive in one of these possible feasible areas. So in the example of the independent developer, it has obviously some value proposition. They have some key resources. They have key partners they work with. They have clearly a cost structure, which in the case of an independent developer would be to minimize cost, uh, royalties, and so on and so forth. And they predominantly work in a particular value chain. So a company like an independent developer of the 46 possible characters in the sector will have some of them, will not have many of them. So broadly what this is showing is the characters the company has, it's resilient to the problem. The characters the company does not have, it's susceptible to the risk. So when you use the word and say, what is an organization resilient to? Well, you are only resilient to something that you possess as a character. And therefore, the things you are exposed to as a risk are the characters you do not 
possess as a company. So that's the sort of research we've done, but we thought it would be very sensible and useful if we can convert all of this in a fairly simple toolkit. And what my colleague uh, who is working on this project in Durham and now is gonna pursue his PhD in this area has done along with Nick is to develop a simple software. And the reason I use the word simple is because it basically asks you questions in a fairly traditional questionnaire format. And depending on what your answer is, the toolkit will go and try to tell you three very simple and specific things. The first thing it will tell you is, what is your resilience profile? It will tell you what is therefore your risk profile. It will also tell you as a company where you fit in that big tree-like structure. Therefore, who is your competition? Who can you benchmark yourself to? And more importantly, what are the possible ways of evolution for you as a company? Because there are only finite number of ways once you're in a given point on the tree, you can move and maneuver. So it gives you some very exciting information, which I think is sort of beyond the sort of traditional, technical, finance-related information, which probably you are used to uh, if you're particularly working with accountants and uh, some form of VC companies. Uh, so what we will do next is to give you a very quick demonstration. I think it's an offline demonstration, but nevertheless, you can play with this toolkit because it's set up on online uh, in the... Uh, in the foyer, but also it's on our web page. On which note, I'll call Kieran Purvis uh, to come and give a quick demonstration about the toolkit. Thank you very much, Kieran. Thanks. Uh, so my name's uh, Kieran Purvis uh, from Durham University Business School, and I've spent the past year working with uh, colleagues uh, Professor Fernandez and Nick uh, to build this uh, web-based toolkit uh, to help uh, companies make use of the research that they've just uh, described in terms of business model evolution and resilience. Uh, so it's, uh, this is the home page of the toolkit. Um, the, uh, the idea is that games companies can register for an account uh, and log in. And once you log in, you'll see this uh, basic profile page. So this lets you set up things like the turnover of your company uh, the net assets, just basic sort of uh, profiling information. Uh, so the first thing you'll want to do is uh, go to the question section, and you'll find a sequence of 55 questions in there that, that ask you about uh, various aspects of your business. So, for example, here uh, we ask about your value propositions, and this is just a general classification uh, about the uh, types of uh, activities you do. Uh, so if you work through these uh, questions, uh, you get to the point that all of the sections of the survey have been completed, uh, and then we can move on to the analysis and output of the toolkit. So the first and, and probably simplest output is we plot the characteristics we identify in your company on a business model canvas. Uh, so this is split into three key sections, the value proposition, value creation, and value capturing aspects of your business. Uh, each of these characteristics can be explored further. If you click uh, on the, uh, the, the little tabs, we explain a bit more about what each one is all about. So, for example, in-house development is uh, characteristic number 2.1. Uh, so the next step is perhaps a bit more in-depth. This is uh, a map of all of the archetypes or business model components that, that we've identified in the digital games industry. Uh, so the, the full uh, set is the, 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 the items in grey, and we identify for your company uh, which ones are applicable to you, so that's highlighted in the blue. Uh, you'll also notice that your company might possess several characteristics that aren't actually part of a given archetype, uh, so that can be quite useful in seeing which other archetypes or business models you're potentially quite close to. <laughs> and can move towards with the minimal amount of additional uh, effort. Uh, so in this case, in order to move to, to third-party developing, uh, as an independent developer, there's a, there's a number of characteristics, such as 2.7, that you could perhaps look to acquire. Uh, so for example, 2.7 would be self-funded development. Uh, so the final part of the analysis is uh, a look at the uh, 
the resilience that your company has based on the characteristics we've identified. Uh, we categorize them as either stress uh, resilience, so this is resilience to ongoing uh, long-term factors, uh, or disturbance resilience, so this is resilience to, to one-off short-term type of events. Uh, so the toolkit will put in dark colors the, 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 the characteristics that you already have resilience to and identifies where the, the corresponding risk there is in, in, in the paler colors of the pie chart. Uh, and for completeness, we provide a, a listing of the characteristics in, uh, that we've identified in your company as well as the other ones that are in the industry. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's that. So, if you could, uh, if, if anyone hasn't already filled in the toolkit, I'd like to invite you to come and find uh, me at the demonstration, and uh, I'd be very keen to go through filling it in with you for your company. And I'll pass over to Dr. Alberto uh, to take things further. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. So, value and business model, actually, that's what we're going to talk about now. Uh, my name is Alberto Nuncerelli. I'm uh, formerly a uh, research fellow at CAS Business School, now visiting at the same school and lecture at the University of Trento. Uh, actually, I organized my, um, my work done uh, within Nemo in two main parts. Uh, the first one is crowdfunding and evolving value chain. So basically, we've been looking, we've been observing that reward-based crowdfunding is, is uh, one of the main phenomena that can be observed uh, within the, um, the development of games for entertainment. And we've been wondering how uh, reward-based crowdfunding impacts somehow the process of value creation within the industry. Uh, the second part, actually, it's about the new business models in the game industry. We mostly focused here on the um, on serious games and the development of serious games. Uh, and basically, we look at how business models can be designed for serious games, observing the, the particular role of customer uh, within this, uh, pro this, business, this process of business modeling. Uh, let's have a closer look to our, uh, to our main results, our main funding findings. Uh, well, basically, you're probably all familiar with the representation of the value chain in the game industry as a linear, with a linear structure. So, uh, with funders, developers, uh, distributors, publisher, distributors, and retailers are just uh, one uh, after each other. Um, that's exactly what uh, the reward based funding has changed here. Because... Uh, um, the effect of crowdfunding goes well beyond uh, uh, collecting funds in the, in the game industry, but actually has changed the rules of the, the, the rules of game, and uh, uh, it basically has helped uh, the market uh, going into the development of the of, of any game, and uh, has empowered uh, somehow the uh, the user communities into participating into co-developing the game. So, as given uh, the, uh, the game developers uh, more market knowledge, has given them the possibility to pre-test a game uh, even before releasing that game to the market, uh, and has given them a kind of a portfolio of strategic options that basically allows them to go through a uh, uh, self-development uh, 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 or co-development with the market, self-publishing, self-distribution, and whatever. Or even, I mean, uh, uh, has given the possibility, is keeping open the possibility for them to, to go through the traditional channels of publishing, distributing, and so on. So basically, the, the structure of the value chain has changed quite a lot. And we've, we've been testing these with, uh, uh, with some case studies we collected over the last, uh, over the last three years. Um, different kind of settings um, is the one that uh, led us to, uh, to investigate how business models for serious game can be developed uh, in, uh, in the industry. Uh, well, you, you're all familiar with the fact that if you download a game, an entertainment game, actually, you usually are the person who buys the game, who plays the game, and enjoy playing the game. Uh, that's quite different with serious games, because usually serious games are bought by someone, then played by someone else, and the benefit actually are on top of uh, a third person. So basically, the customer um, can be displayed with three different sub-profiles. I mean, there's a player, there's a payer, and there's a beneficiary. And we've been wondering, well, OK, if we can split up uh, the, the traditional homogeneous category of customers into three sub-categories, how does the value creation and value capture change when designing a business model that can, can support serious games? It changes quite a lot. Because, I mean, you have to create the game for for the player, but you have to convince someone else to buy that game. And actually, you have to be sure that uh, who pays for the game uh, is aware of the benefit that the player then will have once playing the game. 
Same thing for the value capture procedure. So basically, business models supporting serious games must be crafted on the characteristic of technology, but specifically on the characteristic of projects. And now I hand over Min Jian. As you may say, uh, we academic doing a lot of data anal anal analytics. And uh, if we uh, shift into industry, we may get a fashionable job title, data scientist. <laughs> and a data scientist is uh, one of the hottest job title uh, in the London city at the moment. So I just use this uh, as a case to show that um, a lot of companies, they emphasize on data and uh, and uh, treat data as a very critical uh, resource. So for example, data uh, company using data to guide the, the business operation, to evaluate business strategy, and to sense the business environment. environment. Um, but those, but those uh, companies, they are not only buying more powerful computers or collecting more data. Uh, we don't treat that as data driven. Um, what we mean data-driven is a shift of business, uh, traditional business strategy and also managerial culture. It also means for us, the top uh, manager, they need to be aware of the importance and also the limitation of the data and use the data to inform their decision making and uh, uh, also for other, uh, other things. Um, so, our purpose is to develop a methodology to understand um, what is data-driven and also as a, as a strategy to guide the, the business to transfer their business into data-driven. So how are we going to study this? Uh, we're collecting a lot of data. Again, we come to the Google Play Store. Uh, we find out the top uh, 100 uh, company who are already in data-driven. So even BBC, they are recruiting data scientists, and also they release game. And uh, we look at uh, their privacy policy, we script the content uh, and trace the changes uh, uh, of the content. And uh, then we basically ask them four questions. First one is, what data do they need? Second one is, how they're using those data? Third one is, um, how they do data governance? Fourth one is how the data impact on their business uh, strategy and the manager, managerial culture changes. Um, you may see this uh, similar uh, uh, figure before. Um, Dr. Feng Li already introduced uh, the overarching business model framework. So we develop the methodology based on this one. Uh, so the purpose um, for us is not to only to provide a uh, hundred company uh, for you to do the comparing and the contrast uh, on how they do the business uh, uh, data-driven business transformation. We also hope this as a guidance for you to do the data-driven business transformation and help you to become successful. Um, so that's me. Uh, let me pass to um, Dr. Vicky. Hi, I'm Vicky Hodge, research fellow here at York in data analytics. So my research recently has been looking at how the players are influenced by the business model in games. So Marshall and Henning Thoreau have found that there's a knowledge gap regarding how the business model affects players in games. So we've been particularly looking at the value proposition part of the business cycle and how that's affecting the players. So initially we've chosen to look at two deck building games. So in a deck building game, you have to build a deck prior to play. There's a huge pool of cards and a set of rules, and you have to build your deck according to the rules, choosing cards from the pool. These manufacturers of these games release expansion packs an annually, which contain new cards to freshen up the game, maintain player engagement, and obviously to generate revenue for the company. This is where our focus has been. So the two games we've looked at are Android Netrunner, which is a living card game. Each expansion pack is uniform and identical and Magic the Gathering, which is a trading card game, where you, the expansion packs are randomly distributed. They also <coughs> change the strength of cards in each expansion pack, and some expansion packs retire cards from the game. So this is more uh, similar to the Panini football stickers model. So here's a schematic of the business model cycle we've been looking at. 
So the top half represents the business and their value, creation, capture and delivery. And the bottom half represents the players and other parts of the community. In these sorts of games, there's a huge crowdsourcing online community who develop ideas for deck building and have a sort of group thought. Because it's online, it allows us to access this data. So we've been able to scrape 30,000 Netrunner decks and 30,000 Magic decks and also do a sort of sentiment analysis on what the community are thinking. So initial investigation showed us that if we look at how the decks are clustered, then Magic the Gathering has a very different cluster structure to Android Netrunner. We hypothesize that this is caused by the different distribution models. So if you release random cards, you get completely different deck building activity compared to a uniform distribution. So we then decided to have a look at how deck building changes over time. So this is a schematic of the Netrunner data. We partitioned it into 50 clusters, so each column is a cluster, and then each row is a month from October 2013 to March 2016, and it shows the activity in each partition for each month. We notice that there's a huge spread here, so the decks are clustered all over the data space, but we do get, shown by the black circles, we do get these peaks of activity when expansion packs are released. So the players are definitely engaging with the expansion packs, but there's also activity across the data space as well. This contrasts hugely with Magic the Gathering. Again, it's the same form of heat map, 50 clusters in columns, uh, months from October 2012 to July 2015 here. And we see these stripes of activity which coincide with releases of expansion packs. So we can see here that the players are completely engaging with the expansion packs, and there's very little activity in the areas of the data space that don't coincide with the expansion packs. So in conclusion, both these games are huge, have a huge community who are crowdsourcing ideas and coming up with deck building strategies. This makes them ideal for our analysis because we can access that online, the sentiments and the current deck building activity. It's a sort of Wikipedia model where the communities are feeding back into the future development of the game. And then that then influences how the manufacturers release the game, which then influences the community. So you get this cycle of influence. We hope to broaden this out to other different games, um, and we're hoping that this will then provide a lesson for all games and show that how you update your game has a huge effect on the player engagement, player strategies, and ultimately the revenue for the manufacturer. I will now hand you over to Sam. Hi, so my name's Sam Devlin. I'm a research fellow here at the University of York. Um, I'm gonna talk about a couple of the other game analytics studies we did. So first of all, uh, some work we did with We Are Interactive that was led by one of our PhD students, Hunting Z. Um, so Hunting led some work with, with We Are on predicting when people would quit uh, the, the game of We Are Interactive, and he could predict with high accuracy when play people were about to quit a game and correlate that with in-game events to give informed design feedback back to the team. Um, he was also able to predict with high, high accuracy, again, when, which players were likely to make their first purchase, and again, which events in the game correlated with that, which again could inform the design. Um, another piece of work that we did was with AI Factory Spades. I'm glad Jeff is here in, in the audience taking his photo. Um, so AI Factory were very kind to share with us a large data set on uh, how people were playing their game, and also how the AI was playing their game. Um, we, we analyzed this data set and we showed that in certain situations there was a significant difference between how the AI was playing and how humans played. We then built predictive models of how people would play so we could predict given a particular state of the game what action a player would make. Um, and then we biased the AI towards this and we're able to create an agent that can play the game with the same strength as the original agent that was playing the game but now in a human style. Um, we were also able to cluster and find different play styles of how different people were playing the game and understand uh, qualitative differences in play style of different groups of users. Now, both of these studies and, and the work that the Vicky was talking about looked at ways that we could better the game itself. But Peter started out talking about this vision of how we could use games for science. And this data source that individual games could collect um, is a huge resource for us in a way to be able to conduct science. And so thinking more broadly as to how we would use that, we started to think about game intelligence um, and about this idea of transferable knowledge that can be gained through people playing games. We broke this down further into individual game intelligence, where one person plays a game and learns something for themselves. So this is sort of your typical educational games. 
and alternatively, collective game intelligence, which was a new space which has been enabled by being able to now collect large amounts of data from thousands or millions of people play, playing your games. Okay? So collective game intelligence is where we as analysts look at and scientists look at the data that lots of people playing games and answer bigger questions. I can give a few examples. Um, starting with the individual game intelligence, we, we funded a prototype by um, being developed by Ludometrics and Dave Sapien in collaboration with the University of Sussex um, called The Last Bumblebee. And this was designed to teach children about the importance of planting plants in your garden so that you can help bumblebees survive. Okay? This will be available on uh, all mobile app stores very shortly. Uh, we also started to develop one in-house in the Digital Creativity Labs in work led by uh, Rowena Kasparovic and Emma Marsden. And we had some summer students, uh, Jamie, Kasper, and Lynn, working on this. Um, and so this is a game um, that you can play out in the demo section now um, that uses research at the University of York from our educational department on how people learn foreign languages, and specifically about learning grammar. Um, a lot of uh, existing language learning games are focused around vocabulary and are uh, prettified vocabulary tests, whereas this is actually using research-informed methods of how people learn grammars more efficiently. Moving to collective game intelligence, we surveyed a number of works that had already previously been done, and we saw three design patterns here that were being used. Uh, firstly, there were games designed that collect behavioral data. There's a fantastic example here from Microsoft Research on Project Waterloo um, that collect, set a traditional game theory problem into a nice free-to-play online uh, social game and collected data on how people would actually act in these situations that are akin to uh, various types of elections or auction mechanisms. And so they could, there's a game theoretical rational solution on how people should act, and then there's the data on how people really act from playing online and collecting that data. Um, alternatively, there are games designed to collect label data. So Foldit is a fantastic example in this space. This is your typical sort of crowdsourced citizen science game that's designed to create a specific data set. So they were there looking at um, how certain proteins fold. Now, you can do this automatically on your computer, but it's very inefficient, gets stuck in local minimums. Um, but people are very good at this because it's essentially a 3D jigsaw puzzle. And we're good at that. And so um, they opened it up as in, in a sort of game-like environment and allowed people to take part in that and collected lots of labeled data um, to, to help feed their research. And finally, there was this, this rich possibility that people had talked about um, as using data that from existing commercial games, games that weren't designed to collect data for scientific purposes, but were generating data that could be of use in that space. Um, and some people hypothesized that data from World of Warcraft could be used to understand how diseases spread and how certain social phenomena happen. Um, they, their work was all done on secondary data by talking to players. They weren't given access to the data. Um, but we've got some exciting things in the works that, that could work on that. Um, in particular, again, we funded a, a game in this space um, being developed by Orange Helicopter in, in collaboration with the University of Oxford and University of York. Um, they, they'll be demoing outside uh, the game Shallow Seas. Uh, this is a multiplayer fishing game that's useful for understanding the emergence of cooperation um, and also about various elements of how fisheries work and so forth. They'll be out in the, um, the demo space later on, give you a much better explanation of the science that's going on there. Not in my hearing, but yeah, great team. Um, we also have been working with, with a number of partners, and we got a piece of funding um, with them from Innovate UK to, for the Gambit project. Um, so York has 7 million tourists every year and 200,000 residents, okay? Anybody that's been here or, or lives here knows this causes all sorts of congestion issues around the city centre. Now, we could take, building off of now the, um, the stolen successes of Pokemon Go that have imitated what we proposed last year, um, we can build a similar augmented reality game for tourists coming to York to help influence the way they're moving around the city. Okay? This is going to create a lot of data as well coming back to us as to how we can understand humans' movement, how tourists interact with the new city, how they move around that space. Uh, we also did some work with uh, Penn Holland from the ecology department, and this prototype was built by Bogdano, one of our, our summer school students, looking at crowdsourcing models of animal movement in online games. Okay? Um, so this was similar to the Foldit example, where by getting people to build better models for us of, of animal movement, we can understand and, and look, to, um, look to inhabit these, these spaces more, more friendly to the, the animals in that space. And finally, and, and in a piece of ongoing work with, with our keynote speaker today, Anders, um, we've gained access to a data set, primary data set from one of the, um, the largest budget commercial game, AAA commercial games of all time, 
Um, and we're starting to work with uh, Tom Stafford, a, a psychologist down in Sheffield, um, to understand how people learn. Um, and we're using data from this game that was originally designed to entertain millions and has done for, for a good number of years now. But we can use that data to understand how people learn and the different ways people learn um, and gain insight into human learning that can be of in huge influence across science. Okay. Thank you. Peter? Um, thanks. And, and thanks for your, your patience and your indulgence as we as we rattled through about 15 person years worth of work in just over an hour. So I, I think the thing that needs to be emphasized is that, I, I don't know, I think we're actually pretty good at delivery, but, but delivery is not our specialism. Our specialism is depth, yeah? We, we, that we have lots and lots of depth in those areas that we've talked about. So I encourage you, if there's, if there's one of those things that's been talked about there that's whetted your appetite, please seek out the person involved or come and find me or, or any of the other people involved in the project. And, and you know, there's real depth in, in, of knowledge in some of those areas, and, and increasingly so. So um, I want to talk very briefly about the future uh, with respect to research in this area of the NEMOG uh, project. Um, and I'm going to talk to the, about the future uh, very much by relating it to two follow-up projects which uh, uh, have benefited a great deal from the thinking in the original NEMO project. So the first project here is the IGI uh, Centre for Doctoral Training. Um, IGI stands for Intelligent Games and Game Intelligence. So, so broadly speaking, intelligent games means creating technologies which will feed into uh, commercial games and other games, um, which will increase the, the possibility space for designing games, yeah, which will allow the creation of new types of games. Um, and game intelligence is about using games in new and different ways. So uh, along the lines of, of, of Gambit and Shallow Seas, for example, that, that Sam was describing earlier. Um, the thing that Iggy demonstrates is we have the attention of the UK government. Yeah, that games as an industry is perceived as this very large UK industry which hasn't benefited from uh, the, the investment in research that many other industries have benefited from benefited from. So if you think about sort of, you know, aerospace or chemical engineering, well, of course, there's tons of research in universities related to aerospace and chemical engineering. But in this games area, there's this multi-billion pound economy and a very poorly serviced uh, uh, industry in terms of research funding. So we have the attention of the funder and we, we have lots of, of money. And one of the things that we convinced the funder and, and increasingly we're working with the games industry and, and hoping to convince you, is the way that we can work together is via people. Yes, so if we simply go out there and publish papers and sling them into the ether and hope that they get read by somebody someday, well, there's a slow trickle of transmission of information. But we think that the best way to do it is by implant, implanting people within your organizations and getting you to come and talk with us over an extended period of time. So for Iggy in particular, um, we have a placement program and I hope that you may consider the possibility of, of hosting a placement within uh, your organization if you're a games company uh, or a similar organization. Um, and we've got all sorts of models for that. So come and, come and talk to me from short placements where we sort of, you know, we'll, we'll pay the, the funding for the student to longer placements where you, you get obviously a very clear value from that and want to own the IP, um, so you pay for the student. But um, we see that as being increasingly very important and we have a bunch of companies that have signed up so far um, to, to take our placement students and we just think that that's the best model to engage with the industry. So, so come and talk to me uh, or talk to one of the other researchers associated with the Iggy project and we can tell you more about that. Um, the next, oh, I shouldn't talk over this. This is rather lovely. The next project is Digital Creativity Labs. Wasn't that lovely? Um, where we uh, invested in some branding with a local uh, York company and they created this lovely branding. Um, so the numbers here are even larger, 18 million pounds in funding. And the funding here is essentially to support uh, a, a range of, 
of researchers in levels from postdoctoral uh, through to and PhD, of course, uh, all the way through to, to professorial fellows. Um, and so the idea here is that instead of there being, I don't know, so for example, instead of York being an organisation which pays lip service to the fact that we're dealing with the games industry and then you have to phone me if you want to know uh, what's happening, well, that's not going to happen because of the numbers involved. And so we have a large organisation here in York um, with people working in different parts of the game industry with expertise in areas like artificial intelligence, in uh, user experience and user interface design, uh, in uh, gamification and the use of games uh, for, for citizen science and for, uh, for, for other areas, um, and, and, and in games design, uh, and, and, and in, in other areas related to those. Um, and also in areas uh, where the, the distinction between game and non-game is increasingly blurry in interactive media and with partners there including people like BBC. So we have lots of people for you to engage with, engage with me especially today, but, but there are many others uh, that, that would like to, to talk to you uh, about. And, and the thing that we want to make sure here is are we doing the right things? Yet, does your organisation need the answers to the sorts of questions that we're asking? And, and the thing that I keep on hearing, and honestly, this gets on my nerves, is, oh, the games industry, they're stressed by deadlines. They don't think over what's happening three months ahead. Yeah? And I think the people... Sorry, I'm getting a bit over the top there. Let me turn that down. But I think the people who, who are saying these things aren't talking to the games industry. Yeah? So, so these are passionate, intelligent people who have made decisions, risky decisions, because they want to create stuff. Yeah? And this idea that creatives can only see over the, the sort of three-month deadline, yeah? I just kind of think that the policymakers and the, and the people that are saying these things just aren't talking to people like the people in, in this room. Um, but the good news is, of course, that the UK government and the funders, we got them to listen. They understand uh, that, that you know, we can do things over longer horizons. We can do projects over many years of horizons, yeah? As, as long as we don't have the sort of the academic model of, oh, yeah, tell us your question, and we'll talk again in four years' time. Yeah, that doesn't work, okay? We fully understand that. But I, I think it's important now that, that there's sort of responsibility on both sides. Yeah, we, we did something, and I think it, it could prove to be very important, but we want to understand from you what are the things that you think will be making the, the, the Pokemon Go's, the world-leading games, um, that, are, that are maybe not there, maybe the technology doesn't even exist yet, but the games that are going to be exciting people and, and making uh, profits and, and, and boosting the UK economy uh, in three, four, five and, and, and years and, and even longer. Okay, and for both of these projects, we have many partners and we encourage uh, more partners. And both of these projects are long in duration. Yes, so, so we, one of the things we definitely recognise in dealing especially with small and medium-sized games companies is that there are times when you don't want to talk to us. Yeah, because there are times when you've got to release your product, you've got to release your game. But there are times when, when we can have that conversation. So having a sort of a longer time to talk together gives us a much better basis for, for a conversation where we, where we can actually you know, find a piece of research that's going to boost your business, that's going to give us the research papers that remain our, our oxygen as academics um, and that are going to boost uh, the UK economy. So the sorts of areas that we've been working in are uh, using data for research in, in player psychology. Okay, lots of fascinating stuff there, um, and we're working with our psychology department here, and I've already heard of a great conversation between uh, the, our resident psychologist and, and another person here. Um, uh, business models, and particularly business models for applied games, for serious games, for gamification, yeah, for using games in new and creative ways. Um, uh, Esports um, is, 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 has gone... I, I don't know, eSports seems to be doing what games industry has been doing for some years. eSports has this graph that's like this now, yes? Yeah? So, so the number of eSports watchers today will be sort of a few percent bigger tomorrow. Yeah, the, the rate of growth in this area is extraordinary. And so uh, there's no research in eSports, yeah? There's no academic research in eSports, really, um, because it's so new. And, it's, and, and, and at the rate that it's growing, it's, it's a hard thing to analyse. So we've got a project which is looking at, uh, if you've got lots of people watching eSports, 
is there a way that you can harness their enthusiasm for the sports to increase their, their literacy with data? Yeah? And so, so in many ways, so, so the, the campaign for programming literacy has been going on uh, for several years now uh, as a sort of third type of literacy. Well, data literacy is a type of literacy that's increasingly as important as these as maths and English, yeah? Um, so so eSports presents a unique opportunity. We've got engaged people, there's lots of data, and we believe that there are ways of presenting that data, data that will engage them. Um, games and the future of work. So I got invited to a meeting at 10 Downing Street um, where we were looking at the future of work. So what happens now when uh, previously robots replaced uh, people in unskilled jobs, and now increasingly AI is replacing people in skilled information-intensive jobs, or at least semi-skilled in information-intensive jobs. What happens? Do we reach the utopia where we, we're, we're nearly all leisure people except for the people who have to service the robots? Well, I don't think so. But the good news is that the UK government doesn't think so either. Yeah, they're not that naive. But they know that they don't know the answer to the questions, and so they want to talk uh, to people like us, and, and, and we have the sort of the clout so that we're interesting to talk to. Yes, so, so, and one of the things that I think will be important there is, is gamification as a tool for harnessing the enthusiasm of people to do things um, uh, that are of social value. Um, games for mental health, I'm not going to spend long on that, but, but games are an important tool and indeed a prescribed tool in some cases uh, for mental health therapy. Um, uh, Well-founded language games, Sam's already talked about those. Um, Games for Heritage. York is a massive heritage site, and we found that in engaging people with heritage, there's all sorts of things that we can do. Uh, for example, there's an ongoing conversation about a particular piece of heritage and a particular games company that I don't think I'm allowed to talk about, um, but uh, what, will, what that will mean is that a AAA game might well have some characters which are genuine characters from 2,500 years ago in the city of York. Um, Understanding the way that the games industry grows, we've talked about that a lot today, and of course there's a program that continues. We want to understand how this fast-growing industry uh, is continuing to grow. Um, and we're talking with media partners uh, about the convergence between games and media. And the, the conversation's getting hotter there. Yeah, and why is the conversation getting hotter? Well, be, the games growth graph continues to do this, the TV graph continues to do that, yeah? So it's pretty clear to the, the, the media companies, to the tele companies, that if they don't engage with interaction as a primary means of, of interacting with their content, well, they're going to be playing second, second fiddle to the games industry pretty soon. Um, and so the conversations are getting richer and richer and, and sort of going beyond the sort of, you know, what can you do with iPlayer to the way that you can explore um, content on your TV while interacting and engaging with data and with other people and indeed playing a game uh, at the same time. Okay, so um, I'm not going to read this quote, but this is Winston Churchill's famous quote about the fact that we've started something, and I really believe we have started something, and I don't know where the end is, I don't know what happens at the end, um, but I hope that we, we've convinced you at least that... Um, that we do have a, a passion for engaging with you, yeah, with the games industry, with the city of York, with external stakeholders uh, in things like museums and galleries, and with e the education, um, and, and all of these potential partners where we believe that there's a future in using games. So um, it, it's funny, isn't it? When we gave the talk and we all did our bits, it was all I could do to stop my hands, sort of, you know, you kind of feel like you have to uh, sort of clap everybody. So you don't have to clap me now, but please do clap all of these uh, other researchers who did such a great job of telling you about the new web project. <laughs> <laughs>